I'll be talking to you today about my NSC thesis, which investigated the viability of blue cranes in agricultural lands of the Western Cape, specifically. So a little bit about the blue crane. It's Antipodes paradisius, it's part of the Gurde family, which entails 15 different species, 11 of which are threatened. So this is a very vulnerable family. We all know it's South Africa's national bird as well. And it is traditionally a grassland species, and large and long-lived with a relatively slow life history and an average lifespan of around 13 years. So blue cranes are distributed in three core areas throughout South Africa, namely the Eastern Grasslands, the Central Karoo, and the Western Cape. The Western Cape has been recently colonized by blue cranes within the last 15 years, but now holds the majority of the population of the species, with only a small uh, population found outside South Africa in Namibia. They have, although it is traditionally a grassland species, there have been de massive declines in the last 50 years in the grassland biome due to habitat conversion and persecution. So it's also the most geographically restricted of all cranes, and so it is ranked by the IUCN as vulnerable, and the ESCOM Red Book is near threatened. So the Western Cape population is the largest population and also one of the more stable populations. So it's very important for the viability of the species. Blue cranes are found in two main areas, namely the Overberg and the Swartland. The Overberg has a larger population and was colonized earlier than the Swartland, but both populations are very strongly dependent on agricultural lands and are almost never found in natural vegetation. This is because of the high food availability and lack of predators in the agricultural lands, as well as the fact that they mimic the natural grasslands where, where blue cranes are traditionally found. This does, however, mean that they may come into conflict with farmers who perceive them as a problem to their crops. So we came up with three project questions to in explore the overall viability of this population. Um, firstly, we wanted to investigate what are the attitudes of farmers towards blue cranes and what factors specifically determine their attitudes. We also wanted to explore some basic um, parameters that haven't been <coughs> investigated in detail, namely movement patterns and how they utilize the um, agricultural landscapes of the Western Cape. And finally, how survival of the Western Cape population varies between different age classes and locations. So the first section of the research, involving farmer perceptions, we used a se semi-structured questionnaire approach where we went out and interviewed farmers to understand are cranes <coughs> perceived as damaging, what is the scale to what does the damage occur, and um, when it occurs. So what we found was that um, the results were very different between the Swartland and the Overberg regions. Although damage, the, the presence of damage was roughly equal between the two regions, we found that the Swartland farmers specifically reported a very high level of damage, while the Overberg, Overberg farmers did not. This is again found in the fact that 40% of the Swartland farmers ranked blue cranes as the number one bird pest, ahead of common pests such as the Egyptian geese and the spurring geese, while in the Overberg, conversely, 100% of farmers ranked them as the least problematic of the three. The spatial variability is also very obvious when we um, plot our answers on an ordination plot. We see that the Swartland group, represented by the yellow, uh, the orange circle, has a very wide, um, wide and different management strategies. For example, they use um, gas cannons, scarecrows, shooting to scare the, cr the cranes away, and report um, a medium to high need for uh, management solutions. While the Overberg farmers are strongly clustered around no need for management interventions and an insignificant problem rank. So in Swartland, we found that blue cranes were <coughs> reported as being significantly a problem for one specific crop, namely sweet lupins, which are used as a fodder for livestock. Because the uh, the Swartland is an area with limited natural fodder. Farmers rely heavily on sweet lupins. Um, although it's farmed in relatively small amounts, 
it's important for the farmers. And we found that on average, they reported around 15% of their crop was lost to large flocks of blue cranes. But this was very spatially variable in that some farmers ranked reported 1% of their crop loss, while other farmers lost their entire crop of sweet lupins. We found that damage occurred in winter, and this um, coincides when the sweet lupins are forming shoots, as well as when blue cranes form large mixed flocks of both breeding individuals and juveniles. In the Overberg, however, there was no reports of field crop damage. However, some farmers reported minimal damage um, where blue cranes were eating um, sheep feed at sheep troughs and uh, behaving aggressively towards uh, young lambs and keeping them away from the food. Although most farmers were unsure about how much damage occurs, um, the damage generally was reported to occur all year round, um, reflecting the fact that blue cranes are present in flocks, either in juvenile flocks or mixed flocks throughout the year. So what this means is that although the, the number of farmers reporting damage in these two areas was not different, the severity of damage was very different. And this could be for a number of reasons. Firstly, blue cranes may be, blue crane flocks may be more conspicuous on fields of sweet lupin than they would be um, at sheep troughs that are scattered throughout the landscape. And there have also been more recent population increases in the Swartland, and thus farmers may be more sensitive to damage in this region than in the Overberg. Um, there may be specifically attractive fields of lupin, which accounts for the wide, wide variability in damage. For example, some fields that are closer to wetlands or roosts um, may attract more damage. Um, as well as the fact that Overberg farmers have been exposed to significant conservation efforts regarding blue cranes for a number of years, while um, the Swartland farmers have not. So we came up with two major management interventions to deal with the damage in the Swartland in order to mitigate any potential for persecution by farmers. So the main two are using lure fields, where a smaller field of an attractive crop are planted, planted near roosting sites in order to attract the cranes to this area and minimize damage to surrounding landscapes. The second option is using avipel, which is when a distasteful substance is applied to seeds um, before they are sown, and it persists when they're forming shoots. It's non-toxic, but is very effective at deterring crane herbivory, and this has been found specifically in Europe and North America, and it's currently, being, it's currently in the process of being brought to South Africa. So the second portion of our research utilized um, a large data set of colouring birds um, that had been ringed from over the period of 1997 to 2015, roughly. And what we can do is, at a very rough scale, we can plot individual marking and um, individual crane movements um, based on re sightings of these marked cranes. So we can see rough movement patterns and seasonal effects, um, as well as differences in movement between adults and juveniles. So what we found was very interesting. We found that on average, cranes moved very, very little. The average movement was around 13.5 kilometers, and 49% of the cranes we run were found to have only moved less than five kilometers from their ringing site. So we found that adults moved significantly more than juveniles and immatures, but we were unable to pick up any seasonal effects due to the roughness of the data. Um, interestingly, we did find evidence of natal phylopatry. About 57% of adults returned at least once to the area where they were ringed as chicks. And this is a novel finding. And we also found that there was very little movement actually between the Overberg and the Swartland region. Only 13 birds moved out of the region where they were ringed as chicks. And from this map, you can see that there's this plot's um, movements of greater than 20 kilometers. And you can see that there's significant movement between three areas in the Overberg, namely Caledon, Bredarsdorp, and the eastern Nogales Plain, while movements between the um, two regions were rather limited. So what this means is that we can now confirm anecdotal evidence that blue cranes are locally nomadic at a small scale. We found that 
um, blue cranes may be phylopatric, and this is important to understand how non-migratory um, species actually expand throughout the landscape. We found that the Swartland and Overberg population should be treated relatively separately due to the lack of um, movement between the populations. And finally, that the, the species, because of its low-clean nomadic and phylopatric nature, is very dependent on farmer tolerances because one crane may be dependent on the fields of one or two farmers the majority of its life. So we use the same data set to analyse a basic population parameter that hasn't been explored, <laughs> namely survival, and um, we used carp <laughs> capture mark residing models in the program MARC to investigate this parameter. So what we found was that survival was very age-structured in that um, juveniles, immatures, which are two to three years old, and adults, individuals older than four years, had very different survival rates. Firstly, we found that juveniles had a roughly 60% chance of survival. Immatures had around 87% chance, but adults had a very low survival. This is um, incongruous with the fact that the Western Cape population is expanding. With this very low um, adult survival, the population would be crashing. So this indicates a problem with this data set. What we found when we plotted the maximum age of recited individuals is very linear trend, as you can see. What we would expect is something more like this, where juvenile, the number of juveniles decreases sharply um, and then evens out as birds become mature and finally senesce. So this indicates that birds are becoming unidentifiable in our database, in indicating a problem with ring loss. So again, we found that juvenile survival is lower than adults, as expected. We found that our adult survival was much lower than we expected based on the fact that in the Nama crew, a much harsher environment, adults had a survival of roughly 0 0.96. Obviously, the retention rate of the markets depends on the type of market used. We used plastic color bands, but we also, the, the marking strategy was quite um, mixed up for a while. So, for example, the birds were originally ringed using two colour rings on the one leg and one on the other. Then they switched to two, then three on both. So this means that if a bird has two rings, it's very difficult to understand if the bird was ringed using two or had three and had lost one. So this makes us conclude that the ringing strategy we used needs revision. And we recommend the use of alphanumeric tags, which is one ring, and um, letters and numbers on the tag. And so it minimizes the chances of misidentification. So in conclusion, we found that there was a strong need for management interventions within the Swartland region specifically in order to mitigate the potential for persecution in the future, as well as that blue cranes were locally nomadic, with high regional fidelity, and exhibit nasal phylopatry, and also that survival estimates are strongly uh, affected by ring loss in this population. Thank you, and for more information, we have two papers out if you like to go read. Thank you. <laughs>